Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Gail Harriet from the School of Law, and I am here to welcome you to USD's program on Brexit, sponsored by the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy. Uh, that gives me the honor of introducing you, introducing you to someone uh, that public choice economists have assured me doesn't exist. Uh, a politician who wants to put himself out of a job. Uh, it's not that public choice economists are wrong all that often. Uh, they teach us to be cynical uh, about politicians, um, figure that first and foremost, they want to keep their job. Um, and usually that's, that's, that's good of advice to accept a little of that cynicism. But evidently, nobody taught Dan Hannon uh, that fundamental rule of politics. So don't get me wrong, Dan Hennon has been re-elected to his seat in the European Parliament uh, numerous times now. Um, he was first elected in 1999 uh, at the age of what, 14? Something like that. Um, but somehow um, in his spare time, um, he has helped to engineer um, one of the biggest political earthquakes of the 21st century, the successful Brexit referendum, uh, which will put him out of a job. Uh, I say successful Brexit referendum uh, because it won by a vote of 52%, almost, almost 52%, uh, to 48%, but ultimate success still eludes Brexit supporters. Um, three years later, the United Kingdom is still part of the European Union. I know that many Americans are baffled by this. Californians, not so much. We're used to, to initiatives that, that don't quite take off as fast as we think they're going to. Um, but at any rate, um, no one is in a better position uh, to make the case for Brexit uh, and to tell us what it's going to take to get there uh, than the Honorable Daniel Hannon. So Dan, I'm turning it over to you. Well, Gail, thank you very much indeed. And as for public choice theory, I expected not to be a member of the European Parliament when I was here, when I accepted your kind invitation. Thank you to the University of San Diego. Thank you to the Law School. Thank you to the, the Croc Center for having me. I am actually almost the only conservative who was elected at the recent European election. And since I'm a long way from home, there's none of you can vote for me or, or against me, I'm gonna let you into a little secret and tell you how that happened. I was there in the count. We used paper ballots in the UK. And I could see that an alarming number of my voters had scrawled across their ballot papers next to my name, shove off back to Brussels. Except they'd, they'd used a stronger word than shove. And I thought this was it, it was the end, there was no way I was gonna get back. And then I had an idea. And I gathered up as many of these ballot papers as I could and I went over to the returning officer and I said, look, it is plainly the intention of all of these voters to return me to Brussels. Uh, and therefore, all of these should be counted as votes for me, and thus it is that I come to be standing before you uh, this afternoon as the only re-elected conservative, pretty much, in the UK. And what a pleasure to be back here uh, and back with my, my, my friend Gail and other friends from San Diego. Thank you all for coming. In May 1942, Charles de Gaulle made a radio broadcast from London to occupied Europe, during which he said something that jars on the modern ear, that sounds deeply at odds with our current sensibilities, but that would have struck his audience as unremarkable. He said, democracy and national sovereignty are the same thing. His, his exact words were, la démocratie se confond pour moi exactement avec la souveraineté nationale. Now, why would he make that link? First of all, think of the context, right? Pretty much the whole of the Eurasian landmass was under one form or another of transnational tyranny. The Allied cause was about the restoration of national sovereignty, the restoration of national independence. We were, as a propaganda of the time, constantly reiterated fighting for the cause of all nations uh, and all peoples. 
But the idea that national sovereignty and democracy are linked, in fact, goes back pretty much to the beginning of the movement for democracy in the early modern period. When, in the late 18th and 19th centuries, when radicals argued that there should be government of the people, by the people, and for the people, they found that they immediately raised the question, what people? In other words, within what unit is the democratic process going to be played out? And the answer that they came up with was in reality the only possible answer to that question. Democracy works best when the people within that unit feel enough in common, one with another, to accept government from each other's hands. In other words, democracy works best within a nation. What constitutes a nation? Well, here we are dealing with fundamentally uh, questions of sentiment, visceral rather than cerebral questions, right? It could be defined by language, it could be defined by territory, by religion, by culture. Uh, there isn't a, a, a clear set of boxes that you tick. But don't make the mistake of thinking that that makes it any less real for people. Sometimes you can have a very strong and clear sense of national identity with different languages. Switzerland would be a, a good case of where people plainly feel a powerful sense of belonging, very little kinship to neighboring countries that happen to share their language. Equally, you can have cases where there is the same language but very different feelings of, uh, uh, of belonging to different groups, like the, the different speakers of, of the South Slav languages in Yugoslavia. Right? I'm not saying you can exactly define what criteria are needed. But that isn't the same as saying that it doesn't matter or that people don't feel it very strongly. If you have a sense of community of identity, of patriotism, to use a, an unfashionable word, then an open society becomes possible. You can build a liberal democracy on common affinities. It's my sense of patriotism that inspires me to pay taxes to support people that I've never met before. It's my sense of patriotism that encourages me to obey laws even when I think they're stupid laws. That teaches me to accept election results even when my party loses. Because I accept that the other side are opposition but not enemies. Because we have shared loyalties and a, a, a common sense of belonging. Take that away and see how quickly things fall apart. Indeed, one of the uh, ways of understanding the migratory flows in the world at, at the moment is that they are, by and large, movements of people from places with artificial borders where there isn't a strong sense of the nation state to older nation states which are rooted in the organic loyalties of the people and have therefore succeeded uh, as bodies that can be vessels, secure vessels, for liberal democracy. Or to put it another way, any ideology that purports to be bigger than the nation state usually ends up becoming coercive or totalitarian. Whether Nazism or communism or Islamic fundamentalism, anything that says we answer to a higher law than the law among nations. We don't recognize your concepts of territorial jurisdiction. Almost always it ends badly. Think, what was the, what was the opening act, the overture of the Iranian Revolution? Right? It was the seizure of the US embassy. Think of what they were saying, the Ayatollahs, when they they attacked that most basic diplomatic precept on which all laws among nations rest, namely the inviolability of legations. What they were saying was, we don't recognize any of your rules. We're bigger than the nation state. And they got away with it. And like all revolutionaries, like the French Revolution, like the Russian Revolution, they immediately spilled out from behind their borders and tried to replicate their regime around the world. The nation state is a remarkably good protector of individual freedoms because it facilitates representative government and a liberal order. I feel it's important to make that argument because in the end, Brexit was a vote for becoming a self-governing country. If the European Union had simply been an association of states, a club of nations, dedicated to achieving collectively what they can't achieve singly, 
to facilitating trade and collaboration, <laughs> there'd have been no argument, there'd have been no referendum. Who could possibly be against that? You'd have to be insane to be against cooperating with your immediate neighbors. The trouble is that the European Union never stopped there. It never saw itself simply as a club or an agglomeration of nations. It always saw itself as a state in the making. And one by one, it had gathered all of the attributes and trappings, all of the functions that we traditionally associate with statehood. It had a parliament and a currency and a president, a legal system and a supreme court, treaty-making powers. It had a flag and a national anthem and a passport. And in the end, that's what made Brexit inevitable. The British people were happy to have, indeed keen to have, free trade and cooperation with their friends. But what was obviously on the cards in the long run was becoming a subordinate province of a bigger federation. And this is why I made the point about the importance of nationality. When the 13 colonies here federated, they already shared a sense of common nationhood. They spoke the same language, they had similar religions, they'd just been through the, the process, the, the shared historical experience of the revolution. And indeed, if you look at the language that people were using during the debates on federalism, they were already using the word nation to refer to America. They tended, when they used the word country, to mean their own individual state, but the word nation already reflected an existing political community. None of those things is true in Europe, riven as it is by deep historical, linguistic, and cultural distinctions. And that ultimately is why it is impossible to build a functioning federal democracy at European level in a way that has happened here. And I think deep down, the founders of the European Union kind of knew that. That's why they designed a system where supreme power was vested in appointed officials who were immune to public opinion, invulnerable to the ballot box. As a member of the European Parliament, a lot of people find this surprising. I don't really get to initiate any laws. Legislative and executive power is combined in the hands of 28 European commissioners who are appointed following some secret haggling at a banquet among national leaders every five years. Put it to you that opposing that system doesn't make you anti-Europe, it makes you pro-democracy. But why, why did the founders have this mild distrust of public opinion? And here I think we have to look at the circumstances in which the European Union was born. One way of doing this is to contrast your union with that across the Atlantic. All states, all federations, all unions, to some extent, grow according to the DNA that was encoded at the moment of their conception. The United States was born out of a popular revolt against a remote autocratic government. And it had the great good fortune to draw up its constitution at that moment in the 18th century when there was maximum emphasis on the freedom of the individual and the restraint of government. Its founders were determined to prevent the abuses through which they had lived. And that was why, from the beginning, the US Constitution tended to grow along what we might call the Jeffersonian model. In other words, the idea that powers should be dispersed, devolved, democratized, and that decisions should be taken as closely as possible to the people that they affect. And that, uh, that encoded DNA, DNA has led to some peculiarities in the American phenotype, as it were. It's led to some features of American democracy which are at least unusual and in some cases unique in the world. And these are almost all things that are about dispersing power and holding the government to account. I mean things like states' rights. I mean things like balanced budget amendments, like term limits, like the direct election of everyone from the garbage guy to the school board. These things are highly unusual. Very few comparable democracies have any of them. Some have one or two. None of them has the full range. And that's because the US has grown uh, according to the conviction that the best way of constraining government is to make sure uh, that power is spread out. Now, of course, perfectly true to say that uh, we are some way from where the founders would have expected, right? The, the, the direction of travel has not been positive. 
nonetheless, the starting point has been pretty good. Right? Uh, I sometimes say to my American friends that your constitution may be an imperfect document, but it's a hell of a lot better than what you're doing at the moment, right? It's, if, uh, if you were to return more to the spirit and letter of what was intended, I think the government would be smaller and the individual would be elevated above the collective. Sadly, the EU was equally a child of its time. Its founders had lived through horrors which my generation and yours, thank God, have never had to experience. They'd been through the Second World War and through this angry plebiscitary democracy that had preceded it. And on some level, that made them not anti-democratic, that would be putting it too strongly, but suspicious of untempered public opinion, which in their minds on some level was associated with Mussolini and demagoguery uh, and the beginning of national conflicts. And so that was why they were quite deliberate, quite unapologetic about creating a system where, although, yeah, there'd be votes and, there, and there'd be a measure of consultation, ultimate power would be wielded by technocrats who didn't need to look over their shoulder at any constituents. And that's the system that we've got to this day. And that's why it is a system that is so ready to swat aside referendum results when they go the wrong way, as has happened in France, in the Netherlands, in Ireland, in Denmark, in Ireland again, and now, by the look of it, in the UK. Public opinion is treated in Brussels never as a reason to change direction, only ever as an obstacle to be overcome or circumvented. So if you want to really understand the difference between the American Union and the European, look at the founding documents. Your constitution, with all of its amendments, 7,200 words. The EU constitution, it's now called the, the Treaty of Lisbon, nearly 200,000. Your constitution is basically about the location of power. It, it confines itself to broad arguments like where to draw the line, the boundary between state and federal authority. The EU constitution, well, there is almost no field of policy which isn't recognized in the constitution. It, it prescribes what should be the status of disabled people? What should be the policy on space exploration? What are the rights of an asylum seeker? Your Declaration of Independence famously promises life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The EU's equivalent, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, guarantees our right to strike action, free health care, and affordable housing. You see the distinction. One is about the rights of the individual. The other is about the power of the state. And it's because of that categoric difference. It's because of that difference in their original conception that the two unions have gone in such different directions. The European Union does not recognize any national border as a reason to stop and, and not legislate. It, 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 do, it doesn't get the concept of a behind border issue that should be left to more local or national units of government. So to, to give you an example, I am required as an EU citizen uh, to drive my children around in car seats until they reach a minimum height or a certain age. Uh, I'd been looking forward to discarding the wretched yogurt encrusted blobs at a much earlier stage. Uh, I speak, obviously, of the car seats, not of the children. Uh, now, you might think that that makes me a terrible father. Or you might think that it's a perfectly sensible thing. And, 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 uh, but in a way, that's not the point. My point is not whether car seats are a good or a bad thing. My point is, how on earth have we reached the point where issues of that kind have to be imposed uniformly on half a billion Europeans? Isn't that precisely the sort of issue that ought to be determined at national or local level? In all the decades that the European Union has been functioning, there has not been one example, not one, of a power that has been devolved or returned. The direction of travel is only one way. And ultimately, this is what determined the Brexit referendum. In February 2016, David Cameron came back empty-handed from an attempt to renegotiate Britain's position in the European Union. If he had come back with one single power retrieved, just one symbolic gain on something, you know, maybe fisheries or something, doesn't matter what, he'd have then been able to say, look, I've set the precedent now. 
power doesn't only go in one direction, I can bring it back as well. He would have won comfortably in the ensuing referendum. And yet, faced with the loss of its second largest financial contributor, the EU was still not prepared to break the principle that the flow of power could only ever be in one direction. As laid down in line one of Article I of its foundational document, the Treaty of Rome, an ever closer union. And that, in the end, is what the British people voted against. They disregarded all the hectoring and the bullying and the threats, and they politely voted to take back control of their own laws. Now, I need to stress, particularly for anyone here who reads the New York Times, that the, the state of the United Kingdom since the vote is actually pretty happy. I know that if, you, if your main sources of information were the, the Financial Times, the BBC, particularly the New York Times or the Washington Post or The Economist, you might get the impression of a general convulsion in Britain, a terrible national crisis. In fact, on almost any metric, life is pretty good. Uh, exports are up, employment is up, growth is up, the stock exchange is up. And the governing party, my party, is, depending on which opinion poll you believe, 10 or 15 points in the lead. There is no sense of a general national crisis. There is a crisis in Westminster. There is a narrow political crisis. But it's terribly important to drill down and explain what that is. Because the one thing I can tell you that it is not is a Brexit crisis. The thing it is always referred to as in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the rest of it. The Brexit crisis, the Brexit crisis that has made Britain angry and acrimonious and gridlocked the system and turned people against each other. Do I really need to spell this out, guys? Brexit has not happened. Right? Whatever is causing those things, it is plainly not Brexit. Brexit has not taken place. In fact, what's causing this crisis is not Brexit, but the precise opposite. The failure of our political class, despite its repeated earlier promises, to deliver on the referendum that it originally guaranteed. My youngest son is three and a quarter years old. He has lived his entire life in a country that has voted to leave the European Union but has not, in fact, left. That is the crisis. It's not the crisis of Brexit. It is the crisis of democracy caused by a political class that doesn't mean to honor its promise. Before the referendum, every party, every party without exception, promised to uphold the outcome. And in fact, I have to say, the parties that were campaigning in favor were especially aggressive in the way that they made that pledge. Oh, anyone who doesn't implement this, anyone who wants to carry on the fight will not be forgiven, right? There was a particularly funny uh, shtick by the then leader of our Liberal Democrats, who's now here in California, where he said, anyone who doesn't accept the result will be like one of those Japanese soldiers on one of those islands in the Pacific 15 years after the war had ended, still carrying on. Of course, piece of irony, so beautiful it should hang in our National Gallery, that precisely predicted his own behavior. He couldn't let it go because, of course, he didn't get the result he wanted. And this is the real Brexit crisis. The crisis I can summarize very simply. When our members of parliament decided to put the question of whether you wanted to be in the EU to the general population, it never occurred to them that they might not get the answer they wanted. And so all of the promises that they'd made in the campaign suddenly went by the wayside. But it's even worse than that, because we had the referendum in June 2016. We then had a general election almost exactly 12 months later. And at that general election, the two main parties, which between them got 80% of the vote, both promised to uphold the referendum result. Now, my party, the Conservative Party, has at least voted that way since. But it turns out that the other big party, the Labour Party, didn't mean it. That's what's causing our crisis. 85% of members of this House of Commons were elected on the basis of manifesto promises saying that they would implement the referendum result, and it now turns out that they had their fingers crossed behind their backs when they made that commitment. What I hadn't predicted when the vote came, I knew that there would be resistance from our establishment, and by the way, anyone who doubts the continuing existence of such a thing as the British establishment, I think has had their eyes open 
over the last three years. I knew that there would be some pushback from our civil service, from our judiciary, but I was not prepared to see them uproot every guardrail, tear down every precedent, violate every norm, smash everything up on their way out in order to try and keep us in the European Union. There's been a pushback from our officials, there's been a pushback from our courts. And I know this is an, an indelicate point to make, right? There's a, so I'll say this since I'm a, a guest of the law school here, there is a, an odd asymmetry in politics where lawyers are allowed to criticize politicians but not the reverse, at least in Britain. If, if you criticize lawyers, you're impugning the integrity of the, and the independence of the bench and da 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 da, right? And yet, here we had a situation where a newly created Supreme Court, on the basis of no statute, no legislation, decided to overturn a political decision because they didn't like it. It was the very definition of judicial activism, ruling on the basis of what they thought the law ought to say rather than what it said. And fine for, uh, for people to support that decision, but don't then retreat huffily into platitudes about the independence of the judiciary when people point out that that's what happened. The, our barristers from whom our judges are drawn got together a round-robin letter three days after the referendum, three days after the referendum, more than a thousand English barristers, English and Welsh barristers, signed an open letter to the government telling them not to implement the referendum result because they didn't like it. Now, of course, lawyers are as entitled to their political opinions as anybody else. But surely the corollary is that the rest of us are allowed to observe that they hold those opinions. So we are now in a, I say, a, a political crisis caused by MPs not doing what they promised, and the judiciary supporting them, rather than allowing the government to do what it promised at the last election. And we're in a completely unprecedented situation where we have a kind of a double set of, uh, of democracy dodging. We have a, a House of Commons that is A, unwilling to implement the referendum result, and B, at the same time, unwilling to dissolve itself and allow a new set of fresh elections because they're worried that people might vote to re-elect Boris. That's the crisis, guys. It's nothing to do with Brexit, which, to repeat, has not happened. The crisis is caused by an out-of-touch elite refusing to honor its commitment to the country. What will happen? Well, look, let me, let me preface this by saying any Brit who tells you for sure what is going to happen next in the Brexit row, general rule of thumb, general heuristic, I might say, not only do not listen to what he says on that subject, but do not listen to what he should say on any subsequent subject ever. Because anyone who thinks he knows for sure what is going to happen is either a liar or a fantasist. I can only go with the one fact that I see out there, which is a clear and growing opinion poll lead for the Conservative Party. Because people can see what is going on, and are frustrated. And so I've got to go with it, the idea that sooner or later, when the election eventually comes, it will be won by the politicians promising to implement the verdict of the referendum. And what then? What's the future of a post-EU Britain? Well, I hope that we will be, once again, a global Britain interested and engaged in the affairs of every continent, including Europe. But one of the things that we will immediately be able to do when we leave the European Union is to sign our own trade deals. I said earlier that the EU controls almost every facet of national life. One of the things that is even now not widely appreciated outside the EU is that when a country joins the EU, it gives Brussels 100% control of all of its trade. In fact, this is how the EU is attempting to, to, to frustrate Brexit, by saying even after you leave, we should control your, your trade in perpetuity, knowing that, of course, no, no British government can accept that. Well, if we get back control of our trade, this is a big deal. It is, it's not every day that a G7 economy gets to draw up its own trade policy. This is, this is an unfrozen moment. We don't get opportunities like this very often. And we have an opportunity to recover our historic and traditional position as the world's leading advocate of commercial liberalization. We want to have free trade agreements with the countries around the world which the European Union doesn't want to talk to. And at the top of our list is this country. Why? Well, for all the obvious reasons. You are the single biggest investor in the UK by quite a long way. We are the single biggest investors here. 
Every day, one million Brits clock into work for American-owned companies. Every day, one million Americans turn up to work for British-owned companies. And that investment rests on all the obvious congruities between our countries. Same language, same legal system, same arbitration, similar accountancy models, etc. They are interoperable models. The thing that up until now has not followed is the trade, because the trade is controlled by Brussels rather than by London. Well, here we do have an opportunity to do something big. And I, I, I'm bound to say when this president talks about trade with the UK, he is in a completely different linguistic mode from how he talks about trade in general. He's suddenly very, very enthusiastic about free trade. And of course, it's not just going to be a trade deal that he wants. It's going to be an incredible, beautiful trade deal. I mean, no one does trade like Donald J. Trump. And do you know what? For once, all of those superlatives might, in fact, be justified. Imagine this. Suppose that instead of doing trade the way we've done it traditionally, the way the previous administration did it here, which is to go for standardization, regularization, harmonization, suppose you just said, whatever is legal in your country is legal in ours and vice versa. Boom. And that this mutual recognition should apply to goods, to services, and to professional credentials. Then you'd have trade that worked for the little guy rather than for the big corporates. Under the previous administration, there was a sort of desultory attempt to have an EU-US free trade agreement. It was called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP. And you were allowed, as a member of the European Parliament, to kind of look at it, as long as you didn't record any of the papers. They kind of confiscated your, your phone as you went into this room, and you were allowed to read it. You weren't allowed to make notes. I did that often enough to see what was going on. Not in every area. There were definitely some good elements here. There were some liberalizing elements. But there were clear examples of collusion among cartels on both sides of the Atlantic. You could see cases where big American corporates and big European corporates had got together and said, hmm, why don't we take the worst of your regulation and mash it together with the worst of our regulation? And then we will have built the barriers to entry so high that no one will be able to challenge us, and we will enjoy a monopoly for decades. And that's why we should go for absolute reciprocity rather than any kind of standardization. And if we did that, it would set a gold standard in how to do trade. It would be a far better and more attractive system than the one that has worked until now. I want to leave time for your questions. I hope we can have a discussion. So let me just end by making a Californian point. I, as a, a British politician, always saw my goal as being to repatriate some of the best elements of the American Revolution. When I spoke about that Jeffersonian model, the idea of the election of everybody, the diffusion of power, but that wasn't invented in a, in a vacuum. A lot of the patriot leaders were drawing on not just theory, but practice from what had happened, particularly in the parts of Eastern England, which a lot of them had come from. We've tended to lose a lot of those traditions, not least since and as a result of joining the European Union. But here they were enshrined in that little secular miracle that happened in the old courthouse in Philadelphia. And I always saw it as my job to kind of bring home the revolution, or at least elements of it. In other words, having left the European Union, having got power back from Brussels, there was no purpose in leaving it all to fester in London. For me, Brexit was not an end, but a beginning, a beginning of a process of pushing those powers downwards and outwards to local government, or better yet, to individual citizens. And of course, I was rather inspired by a number of the things that happened here, the, the ballot initiatives, the direct election of everybody, and so on. But I'm bound to say, when I look at the United States now, I believe that that tradition is under pressure here and is in retreat. I think it's very difficult to look at developments in the 20th and 21st centuries without observing a long-term shift in power here from the 50 states to Washington, from the elected representative to the administrative state, to the unelected functionary, and from the individual citizen to the government. And that alarms me, because if you guys lose the model, 
then who is there to inspire the rest of us? Which brings me to California. The vineyards at the other end of this state, and indeed some of the ones locally, because I believe you have some even near San Diego. A friend of mine has a, a, a stake in one of them. The vineyards here were all originally planted with European vines. People took cuttings from France, from Spain, from Italy, and brought them here where they found fertile soil. In the 19th century, there was a terrible blight in Europe. It was called phylloxera. And it almost completely wiped out European viticulture. The old vineyards were left sterile and desolate, and it looked as though nothing would come back. And so the Europeans of that era, needing to replant their vineyards, came here. And they took cuttings back to the ancestral vineyards to try and replant them with the closest genetic material that they could, which had been preserved here in the New World. And that was how I saw my task. Rediscover and revive that Jeffersonian model, that ideal of diffuse and decentralized power. Imagine how they would have felt, those European wine growers, if when they arrived in California, they found that the aphid had got here before them, and that the egg was already on the leaf, and that there was nothing to take home. So that's why I want to end with a plea to those of you who believe in constitutional government to preserve the system that you have been lucky enough to inherit. Being an American citizen, born or naturalized, is an incredible privilege. But that privilege also carries with it a responsibility, a duty to keep intact the freedoms that you have been lucky enough to be given and to pass them on securely to the next generation. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a little bit of time left. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to take any comments or questions, whether on Brexit or what I was talking about, or on any wider subjects uh, while I'm here. So please, over to you. Hello. Um, those are all well-articulated points. So how do you overcome... Great question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. There's we'll more. Stop yeah. there. I just yeah. say good things. Um, so those are all well-articulated points. So how do you overcome the narrative when people bastardize your argument by saying it's all r racially motivated, uh, Brexit was? I will give you a rule of thumb. Any Brit who tells you that Brexit was all about immigration voted Remain. I've yet to come across an exception to that rule, right? Any lever knows that that was not the issue. And I think what happened here is that very early on, some of the US media, because the, the, the two events happened to be fairly proximate in time, decided that Brexit was the British Trump victory, and that everything that happened had to therefore be seen in the context of Trump. And that therefore Brexit must have been a nostalgic, nativist, backward-looking uh, project, right? They had this much in common, I'll concede this. When you are against the status quo, you are bound to use some of the same arguments. So there were parallel arguments about the failure of the governing elite and the need for something different. But beyond that, it becomes a very strained parallel, right? A very big part of Donald Trump's 2016 election manifesto, if I understand it correctly, was that he didn't want free trade with China. You know, he was fed up with all the currency manipulation. He didn't want free trade with Mexico. He didn't want all the outsourcing of jobs. And stuff. A huge part of the Leave campaign was that we did. We do. We do want free trade with China and with Mexico. We're not getting it or anything like as much as we want to with the EU because the EU is a relatively protectionist body and a post-EU Britain will be a much more free trading entity, right? So there was, a, there was a, a, a very substantial difference in tone and policy uh, between the two movements. As far as immigration goes, it is certainly the case that we want to control the immigration question, just like we want to control our fisheries, our industrial policy, and everything else. So immigration was one of a number of issues that people felt should be determined through our own national democratic mechanisms and procedures. But I don't think anybody could fairly claim that they voted leave because they were expecting a massive crackdown in immigration. 
In every big set piece debate, in every broadcast, in all the literature, we made very clear in the Leave campaign, and I was the guy who, who appointed the chief executive and did the initial fundraising and so on, we made very clear that control of who came into the UK was not going to mean zero immigration or a radical crackdown. It was simply going to mean that ultimately we were in charge. And in fact, one of the arguments that I was very conscious of was that we needed to have a fairer migration system so that instead of people from our Commonwealth allies being overlooked and, and leapfrogged by people who had no connection to the country, they would all be on the same basis. It was, it was a crazy situation where you were having because you had to have, obviously, there's, there's a practical limit, like it with all countries. If all of your places were being taken by unskilled workers from Romania and Bulgaria and so on, effectively, you were having to turn away qualified, skilled computer programmers from Bangalore and so on. And this was an, an intolerable situation and not a way for a country to survive and thrive. Um, I'm bound to say, so I, I, I mean, this, this state I've always felt is, is in the foreground of so many political developments. Uh, in the US, including both the, the demographic changes of, of migration and the, the reaction against them. But one of the things that always makes me quite cheerful when I come to California, despite the politics of the state, is the sense of being surrounded by people who have chosen to come here. You know, you, you've, you've got, unlike in a lot of the world, you've got no sense of uh, social prestige deriving from tenure, right? There is, you, you've got to say, particularly uh, now in, in Silicon Valley, but I'd say it's true of, of the whole state, you've got a sense that people have come here from Germany, from Indonesia, from Brazil, whatever, because they had the energy and enterprise to want to, to, to move and work here. If you want to succeed as a country in a competitive world, those are the people you want, right? So, so let, me, uh, let me finish my answer by quoting that great, my favorite uh, Californian politician, the greatest president of modern times, um, not, not Richard Nixon for the avoidance of doubt, uh, but Ronald Reagan, who when he talked about this, and I, I wish we would hear language like this today, he said, every immigrant makes America more American. Let's not, remember, let, let's not forget the, the case that can be made for controlled legal immigration, allowing talented people to bring their unique skills here. Uh, yes. Yeah. Shall I just do, do, do? We need do we need a mic in the audience, or should you oh, want it? I mean, the, the acoustics in this. Yeah. I got a mic. I'll bring it over there right after. But this gentleman has it. The, the acoustics in this room are great. Shoot. Is there is there any basis oh, yeah. for Russia being involved with Brexit? There have been articles in the New York Times where I believe it's a Mr. Banks was the person who provided a lot of the financing, his wife is Russian and he's a diamond dealer that had business in Russia. Is there any basis to that? But let me say that, again, it's been reported that Russian money has funded the right party in France, mm. Austria, and Italy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, by the way, and on that last point, I think it probably has. Uh, the uh, the Russians, just, just like the Americans, to be fair, spend money abroad, right? And, and I suspect that they probably tried to influence your election here, which is not the same thing as saying that they were doing it with the approval of the people in that election, but it, it, it is what they do. Uh, but I really want to, to, to emphasize this point about Aaron Banks. Under UK election law, when you have a referendum, there is a designated campaign organization on each side. And that campaign organization is the one that is allowed to spend money, indeed receives some money from the, from the or receives things like free mail shots uh, from the government. And there's a process you have to go through to show that you are a genuinely representative body to gain the designation. Uh, Aaron Banks wanted to be part of the Leave campaign and was excluded because we had doubts about his character. He then set up a rival organization which spent all of its time attacking the official Leave campaign. Didn't spend any time attacking the EU. Okay, so Vote Leave, which was the official designated Leave campaign, the organization that did all the funding, that, that was the one that was led by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove that brought together all the labor and liberal and trade unions and all the rest of it. We had nothing to do with Aaron Banks beyond being regularly sued and harassed by him because he was uh, playing... 
these kind of silly antics throughout the campaign. If you are fundamentally opposed to Brexit, you will deliberately refuse to see that. And if it does come out, and I, you know, the presumption of innocence should not be a mere piety, but I certainly believe that Aaron Banks is capable of doing all sorts of terrible things, should it come out that he has done something improper? Of course, that will not be reported as, you know, well-known shyster Aaron Banks is, has done. It will be reported as the Leave campaign. So I just want to make very, very clear, he was not the Leave campaign. He could not have been less the Leave campaign. He tried to, 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 to join and was kicked out and had nothing to do with the Leave campaign. And as far as I'm aware, no one has accused the Leave campaign of receiving money improperly from any source that we shouldn't have done. Yeah. Hello, this is from a fellow Commonwealth citizen subject. Um, so you're a member of the oldest political party in the world. I don't know, the Tories must go back 250 years. And you were careful to not be too explicit about the fact that the House of Commons, the number of MPs who were selling their constituents down the river included an awful lot of Conservative MPs, 21 of whom have been um, at least tentatively ejected from the, from the party. And it seems to me that I just had a half a year in London that I am not at all certain that um, we would be in the situation we are now, as in closer to Brexit, if Nigel Farage had not set up the Brexit party and with what, within eight weeks, they were leading in the polls for the, for the European election. And so my question has to do with the next national election. Uh, if the Tories don't come to some sort of arrangement with Farage, the hope on the other side will be that you split the vote and remain wins. And so far, everything Boris has said, and I, I like Prime Minister Johnson, but is that he is unwilling to cut a deal with Farage. Even in the north of England, where it looks to me that Brexit would have a much better, the Brexit party would have a much better chance of winning northern labor working class seats than the Tories. Do you see any prospect that this is all just a show for Boris or that they will cut a deal with the Brexit party? Or do you see them? going into the election, running against each other in every constituency. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to the Big Dominion tomorrow because there is, of course, as you know, an uh, election there. And, uh, uh, and the, the Tory leader in Canada was one of the handful of overseas friends who backed Brexit publicly before the result. Uh, and I feel that that was a real act of friendship. No one thought we were going to win. So I always said to him, I owe you one. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm now going to campaign with him uh, until polling day. In terms of the pact, first of all, there is a, there's a straightforward issue of are these the right people to get into bed with? And you heard what I just said about Aaron Banks. Uh, there, is a, there are real questions about uh, what might come out. Second, I'm not sure that it would actually benefit either party to have a pact. The mistake that people make is they look at the opinion polls and they say, okay, the Tories are on 35%, Brexit Party's on another 11%, add that together and you've got 46 It never works like that. When you have these tie-ups, both parties lose some of their supporters. The Tories lose supporters from people who don't like the Brexit Party. Brexit Party particularly would lose a lot of supporters who were ex-Labour who say, oh, now, you're, now you've gone in with the Tories. And then third, if there were to be such a pact, I think it would almost certainly push Labour and the Lib Dems into coming to a similar arrangement, whether formally or informally at local level. So the, I don't think a pact would work, and I don't think it's feasible. Nor, frankly, does it really make much difference in most seats. So the northern seats that you were talking about, the Tories historically have done very badly in some of them. You know, we, we put very little energy into fighting them anyway. We usually even take our candidates out of them to fight in seats that we can win. Uh, it doesn't really make any difference if, if Nigel wants to fight in seats like those. Constituency like the one where I live on the Hampshire-Berkshire borders, it doesn't really make any difference if he contests that one. We're still going to win that one, right? There's probably maybe 60, 70, tops 80 seats where he might have a negative impact on us if he stands. And ultimately, that's got to be his call. The phrase he loves to use is, put country before party. Well, let's see whether he does, right? The, the paradox of the Brexit party is this. They cannot now deliver Brexit, but they can stop it. And they stop it if they insist on fighting seats where their net impact is going to be negative to us. 
It's his call. What are your thoughts about the USMCA as we're seeing it packaged as a trade deal? Is it similar in structure to the EU as it was first packaged as a trade deal and then became the EU? No, uh, the EU was right from the start, like I say, ever closer union. So it, it, the, although, it, although there was a, a, a trade aspect to it, uh, it was a customs union, unlike NAFTA or the, the USMCA, and that meant that it, it restricted its members' trade with everyone else. And the reason that it was a customs union rather than a free trade area is because customs unions are a very good way of encouraging political union. They artificially direct economic activity to the other members of the customs union. So Britain, as historically the country that had had the biggest non-European trade, still does. We're still very, very unusual. Uh, we're one of only two of the 20, 28 states that, uh, that have more trade with non-EU than with EU states. We've always been clobbered by that external tariff, so that, that doesn't arise in the case of North America. Um, I have to say, I think, I think NAFTA was a slightly better deal than this. You know, I mean, I was, I was prepared for it to be a, a, a much worse renegotiation than it's ended up being, but you know, it, it turns out it's just being a few tweaks, and although they're negative, they're small. Uh, but I'm much more excited by the prospect of taking a US-UK free trade agreement and making it the nucleus of a wider plurilateral deal among similar countries which share an economic model, a language, and a legal system. Last year, I got 11 think tanks together to draw up what we thought would be the perfect US-UK free trade agreement, including all the big conservative and free market institutes here, Heritage, Cato, American Enterprise Institute, Manhattan, etc. Remember, that, remember that, that wonderful film, The Warriors, where they're, they're all the different... It was kind of like that. They were all sitting next to each other for the first time ever. That was how seriously they took it. And we came up, not just with a proposal for what a free trade agreement ought to say, but with the actual text. Now, you heard me adumbrate the principle earlier. What's legal in one country should be legal in the other. Very, very simply stated. When you turn that into a legal text, it turns into 90,000 words. Good news for all the lawyers here. The reason being that you have to actually create, especially in the field of financial services, you have to create the whole architecture, the arbitration mechanisms and so on. But we have now got that document ready to go. Right? It could be done in theory the day after Brexit. Now, I've been in politics long enough to be realistic about this. Of course, no government is going to just say, great, we'll implement 100% of your text. But if they implemented just 70% of it, how great would that be? And the key thing is this. We have designed it so that right from the start, it is open to new entrants. That it doesn't need to be just a bilateral treaty, but is open to other countries at the beginning. I mean, how weird if you had proper mutual recognition, complete reciprocity, how weird to have that between the U.S., and the UK, and not at the very least include Canada, right? But actually, why stop at Canada? Why not every other country that has a similar legal system, a similar, a similar regulatory model? Who's that? You know, and, and has the same sort of or compatible GDP per head. Who's that? It would be Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Israel. Everyone always forgets that Israel is a common law system, right? We, we don't think of it as, a, as an ex-British colony, but it has interoperable economic and regulatory norms with the others. And that's really what you're looking at here. Mutual recognition is an agreement to trust each other's regulators. If you've produced that product, that's good enough for us. We don't need to run any tests on it. Now, I could make an intellectual case for complete mutual recognition with Paraguay and Vietnam and everybody else, right? But I know as a politician that that's not going to fly. So let's start with the countries that have the same kind of model already, where they, the, the, the professional qualifications are similar, where we already have in the services sector a huge amount of toing and froing. And then let's allow other countries to aspire to grow and become wealthy enough to sustain the obligations and join it. But if we, if we had just the countries that I listed earlier, that's more than a third of the world's economy right there. And a way of doing trade based on, on openness, on on competition, on delivering for the consumer rather than the cartel and the producer, that would be a massive global benefit to have come out of Brexit. So uh, there used to be a moderately funny show on the BBC called Yes Minister. And uh, I don't know whether that would fly anymore with the Brexit situation, but is anybody ever going to try and start civil service reform in the UK? 
I mean, yes, Minister, it, it is now clear it was, a, it was a documentary, right? It wasn't a, it wasn't a comedy. And, uh, and we've seen that absolutely over the last three years. I, I think we're, you know, we're going to have to tackle this. Uh, we've had entrenched bias, unconscious bias, but that doesn't make it any less real, from our officials, from our what we call our quangos, our quasi-autonomous non-governmental organizations, and now from our courts. And I just think the current situation is completely unsustainable. You cannot have a Supreme Court ruling on the basis of a non-existent constitution and, and basically making up the rules as it goes along. I mean, it, it, so just, to, just to spell out how weird that this situation is, the main difference, I was talking about uh, the founders being inspired by traditions that they, they carried with them and uh, particularly common law traditions. There's a very big difference between our 1689 Bill of Rights and Madison's effort 100 years later. And Madison cut and pasted quite a few. I mean, I don't, I don't think he had the sort of you know, word technology, but I, he probably actually literally cut and pasted. But word for word is the same. The big difference being that the 1689 Bill of Rights elevates Parliament because there's no written constitution. And it lays down in terms, proceedings in Parliament shall not be subject to review in any court. So this court case that just went against the government was about whether the government was allowed to prorogue parliament. Well, a prorogation is a proceeding in parliament. So how on earth could a case like that come to court? Right? And indeed, every initial hearing, the judges didn't just rule in favor of the government. They said, we can't, we, we've got no locus here. We can't adjudicate on this. It's, it's, it's a parliamentary prerogative. The Supreme Court then decided to go for this power grab. And the way they got around the Bill of Rights was to say, yeah, a prorogation happens in Parliament, but it's not really a proceeding in Parliament because there's no vote. Come on. And when, 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 when people are putting that in their actual judgment, you realize that you're dealing with people who began with that conclusion. So we're going to need to look at the whole system again. Either we're going to have to find ways of constraining judicial activism. And one of the things I was talking to the law department this morning about was maybe we could look at what Australia has done, which is to... to, to to legislate so that judicial review is confined to cases of kind of individual grievance, not of policy. Or you go in the other direction and you say, do you know what? Let's go for the whole hog here, totus porcus, you know, the separation of power, uh, written constitution, uh, and then you would have a civil service or large chunks of it directly uh, answerable to an elected executive. Now, if I were confident that we would end up with a constitution like yours, I would be strongly drawn to the second option. But I wonder whether you would adopt your constitution today, let alone somebody else adopting it. I mean, ask yourselves whether the US Bill of Rights would get through Congress in 2019. Right? I'm, I'm not at all confident uh, that it would. And so, uh, but I, uh, whichever way this goes, we're gonna need to have a constitutional convention and we're going to need to look at how to address these issues. Uh, and all the other anomalies and barnacles that have started encrusting the way we do things. The, uh, the House of Lords has been swamped with placemen. There is an asymmetric devolution settlement in Scotland. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm enough of a Burkean Tory to believe in evolutionary organic growth, but it's got to the point now where we do need to do some pruning. And if we win the election, I hope that we're going to undertake that as an early task. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Croc thank School. Thank you. Um, my question revolves around what you were just talking about, the constitutional democracy. So you mentioned that the EU guarantees the right to affordable housing and free health care. Yep. Here in our constitutional democracies, particularly here in California, we're struggling with these issues uh, because those are not guaranteed under our constitution. How would you ensure that a constitution post-Brexit in the UK would ensure those? Well, it's really important to understand that the Constitution may promise whatever it likes, but that doesn't actually mean that you get the thing, right? When you have a, a, a right, when a right is supposedly bestowed on you, that doesn't mean that you get an extra right that you previously didn't have. It simply means that somebody else gets to interpret what was previously done democratically, right? Uh, and, I mean, the, the clearest example of this is if you look at the constitutions of some of the real tyrannies of the 20th century. If you look at the written constitution of East Germany or the Soviet Union, on paper you find that they are committed to freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, freedom of religion. In practice, of course, 
as the peoples of those unhappy states discovered, paper rights are worthless without some kind of enforcement mechanism. And so it, 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 I, 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 I find myself hoarse having to say over and over again, just because you think that something is a good idea and you put it on, in a bit of paper doesn't mean it happens, right? It, all you've really done there is shifted the, the, the plane at which the decision is taken. Um, in terms of, you know, affordable housing and free healthcare and so on. I, I, can, I just, can I just make a, a general point about this? Um, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be alive than now. I don't, think, I don't think the human race has ever had it as good as now. Whether you look at longevity, literacy rates, female education, calorie intake, height, you know, any metric. It's become a sort of fashionable thing to say living standards have stagnated over the last 20 years. You know, ordinary people, working people in the West are no better off than they were 20. Come on, really? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some, some of, the, some of the, my, the people here who, like me, can remember life in 1999, right? We had, we had, in the UK, and I guess it was similar here, we had three channels on TV supplemented by an occasional blockbuster video. There was obviously no wiki, no Wi-Fi. There were no cheap flights, or there was one cheap flight. EasyJet was operating one route to Amsterdam. Uh, there was no, incredible as it seems, there was no Starbucks in London. There was Starbucks here. There was a, there was a predecessor uh, called Seattle Coffee that was just beginning to introduce people to the idea that coffee didn't need to taste like ditch water. Now, how do you, how do you measure the utility of those improvements in people's lives? Well, you can't. I mean, how do you, how do you measure the difference between nice coffee and, and bad coffee or, or being able to watch more TV? You can't, so they don't. So the economists only measure the bit that they can, which is wages, right? Of course, the liberation of huge chunks of Asia and Africa from closed economies and socialist economies has liberated hundreds of millions of new workers, which means that supply and demand being what it is, the value of wages relative to capital has fallen. But the flip side of that is that we are able to buy way, way more working shorter hours to afford it, right? And I would love those economists who say that nothing has got better to, to travel back in a time machine, spend three days living in 1999, and then come back and tell me that nothing has got better, right? We are, we are the most um, ungrateful generation uh, since you know, the revolution. <laughs> We're the most ungrateful generation when we think of, uh, of how... That, now, to which the answer is always, well, what about housing? Yeah? Okay, you're right. There is that. I mean, if you had to take the package, right? You had to, you had to the whole package. You're not, you're not allowed to just have the more affordable housing. You've got to, you've got to have the crappy TV and everything else and, the, and the, 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 the more limited food choices and all that. I don't think you would hesitate very long. But isn't it significant that the big exceptions, the big price rises where almost everything has got cheaper in, in the sense of how many hours do I have to work to do it. The big exceptions are the two things which are regulated, to some extent controlled or subsidized, or in many countries supplied wholly by the government, namely education and housing. Right? That is telling me something about how, if you wanted to bring the prices down, how you would go about it. You would, you would free up that system more and allow more, uh, more suppliers to come into the market. Yeah. Um. I want to ask a, a, a question from more from 30,000 feet here on this. Do you think that the, the ties of nationalism have been frayed or weakened in, in Great Britain, for example, as many think perhaps even in this country that um, the, the, uh, the remainers and the sort of permanent bureaucracy, the globalists um, feel less attachment to the nation, qua nation, and do you mm. think that's that's occurred? Do you do you think do you think the sense of, na of national pride and national belonging have been weakened? That is that is obviously true of some people. Um, I, I I think without without much doubt in, in in your country and in mine. And this matters a great deal because a country that projects confidence and brand is a much easier country to want to belong to. One of the things that the United States has been historically extraordinarily good at is assimilating new arrivals and taking people from every continent and every archipelago and making them feel full American citizens, totally bought in to the whole package, right? 
And one of the reasons why the US is good at doing that is precisely because it does the sorts of things that sophisticated Europeans sneer at, like having flags and bunting and, and patriotic songs all the time. But though, uh, those things, although they, they make the sophists wince, those things are precisely what enable the newcomer to feel part of something. They are the, they're the easy way to establish a sense of shared belonging and common space. And this can have very severe consequences when you don't have it. I think probably the, the most post-national state in Europe, the one with the weakest sense of national identity, is Belgium. Belgium was always a slightly artificial entity. It has two linguistic communities that have really very little in common. They read two sets of newspapers. They watch two sets of TV stations. They, they shop at different chains. They barely interact, right? There's no Belgian language. There's no Belgian history. Or very little Belgian history. There's no Belgian culture. It, it's Flemish or it's, it's Walloon. So where does this leave you if you are the child, let's say, of Moroccan immigrants. You're not Flemish. You're not Wallonian. Every interaction you've had with the Belgian state has taught you to despise it. If you've got any history at all in school, it will have been presented to you as a hateful chronicle of racism and exploitation. But a number of people in that community, like all teenagers, they want to belong to something. They, 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 they have a a, 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 a common universal longing to be part of a movement. And some of them are therefore in the market for ideologies that do not lack self-confidence. Near where I work in the European Parliament is a district called Mullenbeck, which is a largely immigrant part of Brussels, which has disproportionately supplied the terrorist bombers and gunmen who have gone elsewhere in Europe. And when you look at the... It, this is not... I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a poor district of Brussels by European standards, but it is not deprived in any conceivable way by global standards. What it's lacking is any sense of belonging, any sense of, of patriotism or of shared uh, loyalty. And if you're not getting that, if you're taught that the nation state is a discreditable enterprise, that it's, a, it's one step away from ethnic hatred and war, you will look elsewhere for your identity. Whatever else we say, about these jihadi extremists, they are good at projecting self-confidence. And that's why I think if any country is going to succeed, especially in an age of mass migration where multi-ethnic states are normal, the country has to have a story that everyone can buy into and has to be unapologetic about promoting that story. And that means, it doesn't mean saying that you're, you're always right. Every country has its sordid moments. Mine does, yours does. Every single one has made mistakes. But if you only go around the world apologizing, you make it very, very hard for the newcomer to want to belong. And that's been the great success story of this country. It's been the, the, uh, the inspiration that has drawn tens of millions of settlers to a dream of a political system turned into the reality of a functioning polity. And if you ever stop promoting that, see how quickly things will fall apart. Hi. Do you think that Brexit will affect Northern and Southern Ireland in terms of the tension that's left over from the Troubles? No, I really don't. That, that is over. Uh, I speak as someone with a, a family background in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the, uh, the, the Irish issue was put on the table because the EU did not want a post-EU Britain to have an independent trade policy that would allow it to have free trade agreements with the US and elsewhere. But they realized that this, this made them sound pretty silly, right? It, it, no neutral observer, no fair-minded person would think that that was a fair proposition. So rather than saying, we must control your trade after you left, what they said, uh, what they said was, we need to prevent a border in Northern Ireland, or a border in Ireland, which might lead to a resumption of political unrest. Well, the current proposal put forward by the British government, I think all sides agree, does not involve any infrastructure at the Irish border. We all agree that there's going to be an invisible border. Nobody wanted there to be any kind of checkpoints. That was never on the agenda. Of course, the border will still technically exist as a jurisdictional demarcation, right? And just as today there are different tax rates and different currencies on either side of it, so there will be some differences in customs duties. But none of that requires technical uh, it requires physical infrastructure, right? You, you make your customs declarations like you make your tax declarations online uh, in advance, and if there's any checks, they can be done at the warehouses. 
But we now see the EU was never interested in avoiding a border. They were only interested in forcing Britain to stay in the customs union so that we couldn't have an independent trade policy. And that's where this whole nonsense about a border in Ireland came from. If we end up leaving with no deal, I hope that doesn't happen. It would be much better to leave with a deal. But if we leave without there being an accord, one immediate consequence will be to expose that lie for what it was. Because it will be obvious to everyone that there is no change at the Irish border and that Britain has managed to leave without there being any new checkpoints. Uh, what would you say to the argument that the Brexit, the no deal Brexit that is looking like we could very well have isn't in fact the Brexit that people voted for back in 2016 in terms of trade deals with the EU and the single market and things like that? Mm. Well, I, I very much hope we get a deal, right? And, and before, during and since the referendum, I have argued for us to have a close and friendly relationship with the EU, modelled ideally on, on what the Swiss do. Uh, some, you know, in the, in the common market, but not in the common political institutions. It seems to me that that is the only fair way to interpret a narrow vote. 52-48 is a mandate for a phased, gradual recovery of power. It's not, it's not a mandate for, for, for breaking it completely. It does not follow, though, that you give the EU a veto over whether you leave at all. And if you think about it, that is the implication of saying, we must not leave except with a deal. Ponder it for a moment, right? We must not leave without a deal means we cannot leave until the EU is happy with the terms on which we're leaving, right? It would be equivalent to the, 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 the patriot leaders here in 1776 saying, okay, we, we've decided to leave, but we're not going to leave without a deal. We're only going to leave on terms laid down by George III, right? How, how do you imagine that that dim and affable monarch would have responded? He would have, of course, done exactly what the EU is doing. Is he just, just, you just said, well, if you're saying that as long as I say no, you won't leave, okay, then no, right? And, th and that's, that's been the story. Uh, of the last three years. So to answer your direct question, was there a mandate for this in the referendum? I think the, 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 the clearest answer is, imagine if somebody during the campaign had tried to argue the opposite. Imagine if somebody during the referendum had said, if we vote leave, that's all well and good, but we will not be allowed to do it and to implement that vote until Brussels says so. No one would have said that. That would have been an absolutely absurd position, and everyone would have recognized it as such. And that, it seems to me, is a position that genuinely has no mandate. Uh, here's, for what it's worth, this being the last question, thank you again for asking me. Here's what I think will happen, having said, don't listen to anyone. But if, you, if you twist my arm and you, 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 uh, you ask me to name what I think is probably the single likeliest outcome, here's what I think will happen. I think the EU will reject Boris's proposal, because it thinks that there'll be an extension. I can't see how we can get around this statute, so I think there then will be an extension. There will then have to be a general election, probably sooner rather than later. When that election happens, Boris will win. We will then, for the first time since 2017, have a parliament that is prepared to walk away. And at that moment, the EU will do a deal. And I suspect that they will then wish that they had grabbed the terms that he is offering now. Because once we have a parliament that is prepared to walk away from the table, I think Britain will be a much tougher negotiating partner because we won't have a, uh, a parliament that is fundamentally on the other side of the talks. You, you may all within a few months be remembering what I said and thinking, God, that guy couldn't have been more wrong. I don't know. But I, I thought I owed it to you at least to give you my best shot at a prediction. In any event, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It has been a huge pleasure to be here. Thank Good you, Daniel Hannon. Thanks to all of you for coming this afternoon. Uh, if you're interested in keeping abreast of more of the events from the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy, we've got some brochures out front. I would encourage you to grab one on your way out.